Yeah, so I want to I wanna introduce you to the teachings of Lady Wisdom from the Hebrew Scriptures. So I brought a Bible with me, so now this feels very revival-esque, <laughs> right? So everyone take out your Bibles and turn to chapter four, you know, like that. But this will, this will help me keep on track and we can look at, at what the Bible, ha- what Lady Wisdom has to say for herself. So I want to start with an invocation to, the, to Sophia, to Chachma, Sophia in the Greek, Chachma in the Hebrew, Wisdom, uh, Lady Wisdom. And I'll do it, and then maybe you can pick it up. We'll do it just a couple of times. It's a simple chant. But the words are, and I don't use technology because it never works for me. Uh, the words are Ima Kalima, Ima Sophia, Ima Shichina, M Chachma M. So Ima is, is mother. Uh, so, so it's just various names for the divine feminine from different, not all traditions, but some traditions. But it goes like this. Ima Kalima, Ima Sophia, Ima Shechina, Em Chochma Em. Ima Kalima, Ima Sophia, Ima Shechina, Em Chochma Em. One more time. Ima Kalima, Ima Sophia, Ima Shechina, Em Chochma Em. So this is primarily, this meaning the Bible, is primarily a patriarchal text, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, which makes the appearance of Lady Wisdom, however, very surprising. She just pops out of nowhere and begins to speak for herself. Now, part of the the feminine understanding of wisdom is because Hebrew is a gendered language. So the word for wisdom, chachma, is feminine. So it's clear in the, minds, in the mind of the reader, if you're reading it in Hebrew, because wisdom in English is, you can't tell, but in the Hebrew it's clear that you're talking about something related to the feminine. But that's not the same as having a woman suddenly start speaking to you in the middle of a text that is all about third-person wisdom, and suddenly wisdom speaks for herself. So this is what she says. It's in the book of Proverbs. You happen to have a bot? No, I know you don't. But It's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, verse 22. If you're making notes and you want to look it up for yourself. Here's what she says. I'm just going to give you the first line because I have to fix that for you, and then I'll read the rest. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work. <laughs> All right, that's, that's standard English translation. That is awful, terrible. There is no word Lord referring to God in the Hebrew Bible. That is a euphemism created by the all-male rabbinate who lived in a patriarchal, hierarchical society where the rabbis themselves were at the top. And when they thought about God, they they thought about God in their own image. So God becomes masculine, and, and the whole thing is hierarchical, and they have a fixed Lord at the top. And right below the Lord are the rabbis. That's not what the Hebrew says at all. The word that the Hebrew Bible uses for Lord is not a verb, it's not a, sorry, it's not a noun, it's a verb. It's not Lord, it's you know, the YHVH, which is really un- untranslatable. I mean, lit- literally in Judaism, we're not allowed to say it, so it's un- unarticulatable. But the meaning is clear. It comes from the Hebrew verb to be. When you talk about God as, as the YHVH in the third person, if you could get away with it, and you can't because it's clunky, it would be the happening, happening as all happening. <laughs> right? but, you, but it comes up so often in the Bible, you can't just keep saying, the happening, happening as all happening said. I mean, you can't, you know, it can't, you can't do that. So, but when, we, when it says Lord, no, just 
blot it out of your mind and recognize it's a verb. It's the happening that is manifesting, that is happening as everything that exists. So, you know, maybe we're, we, would, we would translate it if we could get away with this Tao or something. But so, so this ultimate reality, she says, this is now wisdom speaking. The ultimate reality created me at the beginning. I was, according to one alternative reading of the Hebrew, it could be I was created at the beginning or I was the beginning. So she, there's this, like Madame Blavatsky says, there's this darkness behind the whole thing that we cannot articulate. And then out of this darkness arises wisdom. And then wisdom is the blueprint, the rabbis artic- uh, said. She was like the blueprint of creation. And then I'll just read a little bit of the rest. Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped. Before the hills were brought forth. Uh, when uh, there was no uh, earth or field or anything growing, I was established. I was there. Before God drew the circle on the face of the deep. Before the fr- this firmament was made, the heavens above. I was there. She is, I would, I would imagine that she is like Shakti to Shiva. You know, she is, she's the dynamic force of the happening. She is not only the way things happen, but the process of happening itself. And she is interested, according to the biblical text, she's interested in us. And I won't read all the different parts, but she's interested in us. She takes delight in life, but especially in human life. And she makes herself available to us. She says that she has, and she has apostles. I mean, this is really, in my understanding, it's not just mine, but, but from an academic perspective, there's a lot of thinking that the whole Jesus narrative in the beginning uh, with Jesus and the apostles and all of that is based on Lady Wisdom. That when it says in John 1.1 1, 1, that in the beginning was the word, that's what she's saying here centuries before Jesus. So when John was writing that, he had, this is a theory, he had Proverbs in mind and where this uh, divine is embodied as a woman in Proverbs, in John's time, hundreds of years later, he can't get away with that. So Jesus becomes a woman. But Jesus is based on, Jesus becomes a man, but Jesus is based on this older female figure. So she says, that she has her apostles, they're all women, and she sends them out to the high places in the town or out into the gates, because it's a very urban text, so they they imagine people were somehow connected to urban environments. And they're calling to people. They call to the sophisticated and they call to the simple. And she makes this interesting analogy, because we might think, oh, sophisticated is superior to simple. But she says, to the simple, the call is, come on in. Just direct, come to me. To the sophisticated, she has to bribe them. And she bribes them with a meal. And she, she cooks uh, food, and she makes wine. And so if you don't want to come for wisdom, come you know, for the free food. And maybe you'll pick up wisdom while you're there. It's, it's those who live simply uh, that are more apt to awaken to her presence and to follow her message than those who are sophisticated and you know, totally, totally in love with their own philosophies and isms, etc. Someone like myself. <laughs> so that's who she is. She's this power, this process that predates everything. What does she teach? So her most famous disciple in the Bible is Solomon. When Solomon is, going to, is chosen to, replace, to become king, Solomon prays to God, and Solomon only asks for one thing, and that's wisdom. He doesn't ask for fame. He doesn't ask for fortune. I mean, he ends up with 900 wives and concubines. He might ask for a private retreat, but he didn't do that either. I mean, I have enough trouble. Well, we're taping this, so sorry. But I, I have enough trouble with just one wife, you know? Let alone, <laughs> I didn't mean my wife, she's fine, it was someone else's <laughs> but, but I have enough trouble 
with, yeah, I better stop. It's just getting worse, isn't it? Right? <laughs> That's the problem when you're sort of working without a net. Anyway, he doesn't ask for any of those things. He asks for wisdom, and he's granted wisdom. And he's, he's sort of like a Dr. Doolittle character. He gets wisdom, and the wisdom allows him to speak to all the animals, to know how the universe operates. And in the book Wisdom of Solomon, he just gives us a summary of what Lady Wisdom taught him. She taught him to know the structure of the world and the activity of the elements. So we're talking about particle physics and chemistry. The beginning and middle and end of things. The alternation of solstices and the changes of the seasons. That's cosmology kind of thing. The cycles of the year the, year, the constellation of the stars. The natures of animals and the tempers of wild animals. So he knows you know, animal husbandry and animal psychology. The varieties of plants and the virtues of roots. So she taught him medicine, pharmacology. Uh, I learned both what is secret and what is manifest. For wisdom, the fashioner of all things taught me. So she's not teaching some esoteric doctrine. She's teaching the nature of reality. And that's what Solomon wants to know. In his knowing, he also comes to an awareness of how we are to live. And that's what I want to talk about for the next little bit. And then we'll, we'll open it up for questions. He comes to this knowledge of how we're, thank you, how we're supposed to live in this, this real, you know, in the everyday world. To understand what he's going to teach us, we have to understand how the world works. And he makes it very simple. In the beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes, how many of you have ever read Ecclesiastes? So how does it begin? What, what do you normally, if someone said, what's the first line of Ecclesiastes, what would you say? Doom and gloom. Yeah, doom, doom and gloom. You know, if, if it was a modern English translation, it would say, everything sucks, and it sucks badly, right? <laughs> I mean, that's how it's mostly translated. It's meaninglessness upon meaninglessness, um, despair upon despair, vanity upon vanity, those kinds of translations. They're all interesting, and maybe they're worthy of study, but they're not really accurate renditions of the Hebrew original. The word in Hebrew is hevel. And it means, it comes from, from the notion of morning dew. You know, you get up early in the morning and there's dew on the grass. But by 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, it's all burned away. When he says, hakol hevel, everything is hevel, he's not saying everything is meaningless. He's saying everything is impermanent. Nothing lasts. And then he goes through a whole list of what doesn't last. And you could, I mean, everything you could think of, I mean, People are born and people die. Relationships end, businesses end. Nature is a cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. Nothing is permanent. And then once you understand that's his opening premise, then you start to read the book of Ecclesiastes with a completely new understanding. He's not depressed. He's saying, here's reality. Reality is absolutely fluid. Nothing remains the same. You can't grasp hold of anything, because as soon as you try, it's already slipped through your fingers. It's something else. How do you live in that radically fluid environment? And that's what the book's about. It's not about, I'm depressed and I just want to kill myself. It's, I live in this amazingly fluid, wild, sometimes chaotic world, and how do I live in it well? That's what, that's what the book is really about. In the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, he just gives you that classic uh, binary of, of, how the, of how life works. I would invite you to sing it, but I can't sing it at all. You know, it's the birds made it famous, you know, to everything, turn, turn, turn. He doesn't say that. But it's, it's a nice poetic rendition. So he says, and I won't read the whole thing, but he says, for everything there is a season. That's what my English says. But it could be a moment. The word could be a time, a moment, a season. I like the word moment because things are really flowing quite quickly. To everything there is a moment. Uh, there's moments of birth, moments of death, moments of planting, moments of, of harvesting, moments of killing, of healing, breaking down, building up, weeping, laughing. It just goes on and on. You've, you've probably heard it a million times. 
his point is not that life is meaningless and it just goes around and all these different things. His point is that life is a series of changing moments. And if you're going to live well in the moment, you have to know what the moment is. If it's laughing time, don't cry. And if it's crying time, don't laugh because it's not integral to the moment itself. So just give you a, qu a quick example. I had this guy come to me. His dad died. In Judaism, you have a week of intense mourning. You stay at home. In traditional homes, you sit on boxes on the floor. I mean, you really make yourself miserable. And uh, you're, so you're mourning as if I mean, it's like when my, when my dad died, I was sad enough. Sitting on a box did not help, or I didn't need that. You know, so I, I didn't sit on a box. I sat on the couch, put my feet on the boxes. But, <laughs> so you have this one week of intense mourning. Then you have a 30-day period of less mourning. And then you have 11 uh, months of just saying the prayer for the dead on a daily basis. And at the end of the year, there's a ceremony and you, you're, you're done with the official mourning. And then you just mourn. You have a, a prayer that you recite on the anniversary of the death. The first week you stay home. During the 30-day period, you're allowed to do, to go to work, to go out, to socialize, but only if you feel like it. You have a 30-day uh, pass. If your friends say, or your boss says, you can work, you, can, oh, you know, I really, I'm just not up to it. And if your friends say, let's go and do something, say, I'm just, I'm not ready for that yet. So this guy comes to me, and he's in the 30-day period, and he had just gone to the movies with some friends the night before. They asked him to go a few times, and he kept saying no, but eventually he gave in. He said, okay, okay, I'll go. So he goes to the movies. He take him to a comedy, which was, you know, a good choice. You know, his dad just died. You don't want to take him to see, you know, something, you know, something sad. So they take him to a comedy, and he's sitting there, and it's a good movie. I don't remember what the movie was, but it's a good movie, and it catches, he gets caught up in it, and he starts to laugh when everyone's laughing. He's laughing. And then he catches himself in the middle of laughing. He says, oh my God, what am I doing? My father just died and here I am laughing. So then he goes into this you know, sort of self-critical thing. And then the movie goes on and he gets caught up again and he laughs again and then he gets critical again. So the next day he comes to see me. And the idea is, can I give him absolution for going to the movies and laughing when his dad had just died? So I won't go into the details of the conversation. It's irrelevant. But the point that I tried to make to him was, what else do you do sitting in a comedy when it's an engaging movie, sitting in a, in a comic movie, everyone's laughing. How can you not laugh? It's laughing moment. You should laugh. When the moment passes, your dad stuff, you know, your grief may come back, and that's OK. But to, to catch yourself mid-laugh and then step out of that moment, which is the moment of laughter, and turn it into a, a moment of self-recrimination, that's not being authentic to the moment, right? So the key the question that he leaves us with, though he doesn't ask it explicitly, the key question that he leaves us with is what moment are you in? What time is it for you? And are you living with integrity in that moment? But he doesn't just leave us with that. So, his world, as, you know, his understanding of the world is highly, the world itself is highly fluid. Everything's in flux. You have to know what moment it is. So then how do you live? I'm going to go through his, oh, I don't know, his plan, his agenda for right living. It's done. This is a book for individuals. You know, he's, it's written to you as an individual. It's like an ancient self-help book. It's not a book about how society should run or how the government should run. Most of it is directed to you as an individual, his contemporaries. One of the things I'd like you to think about as I go through this where he's talking to individuals is how could this work in a more social setting? And I think you can take everything he says that the individual ought to do and then extrapolate it to say this is what society ought to empower individuals to do. But we can talk about that if you want. So he makes it very, very simple. He says, just before he goes into the moment thing, he talks about 
But we always, I mean, you always hear this thing, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. That, he doesn't say that. <laughs> he says, eat and drink <laughs> and be merry, but he leaves, doesn't say tomorrow you will die. He's not that pessimistic. But he is, I guess you'd say maybe an Epicurean. He's, he's celebrating life. He thinks you can live. It's, it's short. It's changing. It's often harrowing. But you can still live it with joy. So he says there's nothing better for humans to do. Right? So he's not even talking to men here. It's actually in my English which you know, loves to put man whenever they can. But it says there's nothing better for humans to do than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their work. That's how he starts his life plan. He should eat well, drink well, and find work that brings you joy. I mean, right there, there's a social policy that was very radical, right? That everyone should have decent food and not live in a food desert. That everyone should have access to clean water. Now, he's not really talking about water. They didn't drink water back then because the water wasn't necessarily safe to drink. So they would make this incredibly strong wine and then cut the wine with water because it, it was safer to drink. But we don't have to take his, uh, the limitations of his time uh, and impose them on our time. Just taking the, the, the teaching itself that... It's not about starving yourself. It's not about asceticism. That as we go into the Kali Yuga, as we go into this darkness, we're going to bring this light with us. It's not that we're going to go through the darkness into a light, because if we understand the dark behind the dark that Lao Tzu talked about, that uh, Madame Blavatsky talks about, if we're, we're never going to escape the surrounding darkness, but we can be a light in the midst of it. So one way you're a light is that you eat well and you drink well. You eat wisely and you drink wisely. And you find work that brings you joy. I mean, this was not written in the 60s, but it could have been, yeah. right? I mean, it's Joseph Campbell, follow your bliss. Find something that brings you, find some work that brings you joy. Now, for me, that sounds like an invitation. If I were going to be preaching for universal... Um, Oh, shoot, I guess lost it. The salaries, you know, the, what's that called? Living what, wage. Well, not a living wage. I mean, when the, the government actually disper... What is it? Universal basic income. Yeah, universal basic income. Because if I had a universal basic income, I could do work that would bring me joy, as opposed to working for Uber, which would just make me miserable. I mean, so many of the jobs that we have access to are just above slave jobs. I mean, you, you, you're barely making it on the money that they offer. And we're supposed to just take it because that's how the society works. But his society would make it so that you could actually have the freedom to find whatever it is to follow your bliss and to find a job that actually gives you joy. So that's how he starts. The first three things are eat wisely, drink wisely, and find work that brings you joy. Then he talks about friendship. It's a little strange what he says about friendship, but he says, you have to have two friends. He says, two friends are better than one, than just one friend, right? Uh, and he thinks that you ought to work with your friends. So maybe that's, it's very hard to understand exactly what he means. But he says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their work. But then he says, two are better than one because if one of them falls down, then the others can lift the one who's fallen down up. So I don't think he means they've tripped on the sidewalk. I mean, if one of them is having, you know, either psychologically or financially or something, is, is, is falling, that the others are there to lift them up. So these are active friends, not Facebook friends. <laughs> and then he says, uh, real friends, right? So then he says, again, if two lie together, they keep warm. So now he's talking about sleeping with your friends. Later on, he's going to say you ought to have a spouse, but... Before he gets around to that, he says, well, you can, you can sleep with your friends. So I don't know what you want to make of that, especially with the next line. Uh, he says, again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though one uh, might prevail against another, two will withstand one. So if one of them, if you're in an argument, you might be able to convince the other one, even if your argument is wrong. But if there's two that you're arguing with, they'll probably be able to keep you on the right track. And then he even says, three friends are better than two. 
So I don't know if he's telling you to, to, have, to sleep with, three peop- with two people, to, and, and it's to stay warm. I mean, remember, that's what you have to tell your parents. <laughs> First of all, you can always say, it's in the Bible. Second of all, you say, but we're just doing it to stay warm. And, you know, the fact that it's 90 degrees outside, because we turned the air conditioner down real low, that's how we... So, you have to, so it's, it's cultivate friendship. So eat, drink, joy in your work, cultivate friendship. Then there's a section that seems odd to most people. So I'm going to walk you through it. He says, uh, he talks about food again. He says, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart. But then he goes on to some odd things. Let your garments always be white. Now, he means clean. Keep your clothes clean. Now, why does that matter? Basically, the commentators say that what he's talking about is that you don't fall into a despair that makes you slovenly, that you have respect for how you dress, respect for how you appear to the world outside. Your clothes are clean. Your clothes are white. Do not let oil be lacking on your head. Now, he's not talking about 1040, right? It's not like that kind of oil. He's talking about, um, you know, hair gel or whatever. I I haven't got hair to do that with. But, you know, so part of it is is saying be well coiffed, well well groomed. But then there's this other aspect that I've read. A commentator says it's it's not just the hair on your head he's talking about or, or a beard. He's talking about your face. He says that your face should be well oiled. So what does that mean? It means that it's, it's, you're doing something to alleviate, to clean it up, to alleviate the wrinkles, to, to make you, you know, more, more, look more alive or something like that. And it leads to uh, this philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas. Anyone familiar with him? So he's very interesting. He's a French Jewish philosopher, uh, 20th century philosopher. And he has this philosophy that's called the philosophy of the face. The philosophy of the face. In French, it's the philosophy of the face. (laughs) So, (laughs) I don't don't speak French. (laughs) So, what's the philosophy? So here's what he says. If you truly see the face of another human being, and his contemporary Martin Buber expands it and says, if you truly see the face of any being, human, animal, tree, he goes through other things. But Levinas is just talking about people. If you truly see the face of another human being, you are inwardly commanded to do no harm to that person. When you truly see their face, that's where the command comes. It's not an outer command from, from some supernatural deity. It's from the intense relationship of just meeting another face. And there's this interesting collection of stories about, I think it's called, but don't hold me to it, Women's Tales of the Holocaust. And it's, it's about women's experiences in the death camps. And from what I got from the book, one of the things that the women did that the men did not was to continually wash each other's faces. So, you know, they had nothing. They would rip off little pieces of cloth and they would spit on it and they would wash the grime out of off each other's faces. I mean, it's, a, it, it's not a metaphor. I mean, it's historical fact. But taking it as a metaphor, it's a powerful metaphor for how we ought to deal with each other. That we ought to have relationships that allow the other's face to, to, to be seen. And that in that seeing, there is this compassion that arises. We live in a society, and I'm I'm completely generalizing, but we live in a, and I know that, but still, we live in a society where the other's face is, is, we don't want to see it. We cover it over with masks. Oh, this is, you know, an immigrant, and this is, you know, or, or, you know, a specific person. This is a, I mean, not a person. This is, this is an African-American, and this is an Hispanic person, and this is a, a Jewish person, this, whatever it is. We don't see the face. We see the label that's given to them. And we're bombarded with this, all these efforts to blind us to the face. So Ecclesiastes is saying, keep your face, and then by extension, uh, other people's faces open, available, bright, clean, shining, 
and then if you follow with Levinas, so that you can see that face and engage with that person with compassion. So enjoy life with the spouse whom you love, which makes it a little more difficult than if he just said with a spouse. <laughs> There's the whom you love part, so I don't, you have to, I'm not going there. So you figure that out for yourself. But it says, enjoy life with a spouse whom you love all the days of your life that are, that are uh, granted you under the sun. So you can make a distinction between friends and spouse. You can play, but I would, I would suggest we just play with it more broadly. He's talking about relationships. He's talking about the most intimate relationships, and he's living in a... Uh, a heterosexual a world where heterosexual trope is the operative thing, but we can take it out of that. He's talking about intimate relationships with uh, one person, and then deep friendships with multiple people, and then an engagement with people in general that allows them, invites them to meet you face to face in such a way that compassion is what, is what arises. And then the last thing he says is that you are to engage, or we are to engage in whatever needs doing with a whole heart, with all our effort. You know, it doesn't say anything. It's sort of karma yogic in this way. It doesn't say anything about the results. It just says that con we are constantly confronted with things that need doing. Do them without hesitation. Do them with a whole heart. This is what he gets from his engagement. This is what Solomon gets from his engagement with Lady Wisdom. He gets the big sciences, but then he gets the way you and I ought to live. And he says earlier in the book that the only difference between a wise person and a foolish person is not where they end up. For Ecclesiastes, everyone goes to Sheol. He has no sense of heaven or hell. It's way too early in the history of Jewish thinking. They don't have that yet. Uh, he doesn't have a sense of any kind of... Uh, reincarnation or recycling or any of those things. For him and his time, everyone goes to this place called Sheol. And animals go there, people go there, and eventually everyone comes out of there in the final judgment. But everyone's in Sheol. Sheol is like, Sheol's like Motel 6, <laughs> where they don't leave the light on for you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's dark and dank and nothing happens there. So. His, his argument is not that we're going to go into some great light. You can't avoid the surrounding darkness, but you can illuminate it with, in his case, it would be a candle. So he says that the wise and the foolish are both going through the same darkness. The difference between them is not some reward at the end. There is no reward at the end. Good people, bad people, everyone gets the same sheol. Uh, reservation. The difference between them, he says, it's like a person walking in a dark room with all these obstacles without a candle and a person walking in a dark room with the very same obstacles with a candle. The light is not the opposite of the dark. The light is, a manifest, is manifest within the dark when you and I live his, follow his, his uh, life path of eating wisely, drinking wisely, cultivating friends, finding work that brings you joy, uh, dressing you know, clean, clean clothes, keeping your, your, yourself, your hygiene up, but your face open to meet other faces, cultivating deep friends, falling in, in love. If you live that way, you are the light. Now he's again talking about individuals. If we extrapolate it to a society, then he's challenging us to create a world in which those things can happen. And that to me, because it all comes from Lady Wisdom, that's what he tells us in the Wisdom of Solomon book. This is what he learned from her. This is what I think you and I can learn from her. And I believe that living along the path that he lays out is a way for us to be what it says in the Bible elsewhere, or le goyim, a light to the peoples of the earth. Um, thank you so much for your humor, because I think we all really appreciate it, first of all. Um, my question, it's funny, because over breakfast we were talking about my ideas of 
being pretty good about being in the moment um, versus you know, thinking about the future. And so I'd like to hear your perspective on, you know, how are you able, what is your perspective on being in the moment and yet being able to consider the future in a way, like a productive way, so that, you know, you could plan workshops, you can pl plan sure. a convention. I can't imagine how many years you're ahead of your themes, for example, when the board is doing this work. Um, so I just need an, a, a good idea of what, how you yeah. can work with these two things yeah. together. So, so let, let me... Let me say a couple of things. One, being present in the moment doesn't preclude planning for the future or even grieving over the past. Because he's not, he's not it's, it's just you can't go back and change the past and you can't control the future. But th my present moment may be all about planning for the next conference. Or my present moment may be all about feeling regret over something I did yesterday and then making plans to make amends for it today. So I don't think being in the moment precludes thinking about past or, or future. Uh, that, that's point number one. Point number two is the moment is gone before I can ever really occupy it, <laughs> right? So as soon as I say, oh, I'm present to the moment, the moment I was present to is already in the past. So I think some of that stuff is just, it's, it's beautiful, idealistic, nonsense <laughs> because it can't it can't be done it can't be done so that's why i like you know there's a book in, in the christian tradition practicing the present and the idea is you have to keep practicing being present because you're always absent <laughs> you're always one step behind being oh i'm not present wait now i'm present oh no now present is over here and so you can drive yourself nuts trying to be present um so i i i don't know if this is the same thing or not but i like to think of it the way he does what time is it you know, what should I be doing in this, this time as opposed to this specific instant of the present? So I would say don't worry about it. <laughs> but that's, that's usually what I say about everything. <laughs> um, I just have more of a, a comment and a, a comment of gratitude, I guess. Um, you had talked about the 30-day mourning period and... and I'm going to remember exactly what you said about the, you know, you, that moment of laughter and that moment of sadness during that 30-day period because I work in grief counseling and, you know, there's so many people who lose somebody and think that they can't be happy. They shouldn't yeah. laugh during a time after they've lost somebody. Yeah. And they, that, that um, incongruence causes a lot of guilt and shame for many people when they're in that moment of, you know, when yeah. they've lost someone. So um, I just wanted to thank you for, you know, bringing well, that to light. You're, you're welcome for that. Uh, I, I, when I, and I haven't done funerals in a long time, but when I had a congregation, you know, doing funerals is one of the things you do, I always thought they should be funny, th you know, <laughs> laughing times. Cel yeah, celebrating, but most people's lives are a little bit odd. And, you know, we do silly things, and when you remind people, if they're mean things, you know, silly but, but hurtful, I don't want to hear those. But a lot of stuff that we do, the quirks that make us interesting to other people are funny. So, so I think humor has a place in, in grief. When, when my dad died, my mom, who's, who's a, my, my family's orthodox. My mother believes that my father is in heaven. He's waiting for her. Uh, and that she will see him when you know, she dies. And she believes that she talks to him and, she t and he talks to her now. So normally I don't get involved in other people's theology unless you pay me to, right? But normally <laughs> I don't go say things, but this is my mother and, and she's saying, oh, I was talking to your dad and he told me this. And I, said, I, and I said to my mom, I said, you know, I don't think it's dad you're talking to because everything you ask him if it's okay to do, he always says yes. When he was alive, he always said no. I don't know who you're talking to, but you know, she asked him, can I give away your golf clubs? And he said yes. My dad would never let her give away his golf clubs. Even if he's dead, he's gotta keep those golf clubs. So, you know, I think laughter is, is part of the whole thing. Barbara. You mention that in the book of Ecclesiastics, it talks about the impermanence of things. Buddha addressed the impermanence the same, of things. In the same thing. time frame. That's what I was going to ask. Can you compare the two? The concept of dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, impermanence, and the book of Ecclesiastics. 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, brilliant observation. Uh, I think they're saying the same thing. The, the impermanent, the problem, the suffering that, and John can speak to this better than I can, but we won't let him. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the dissatisfaction that is dukkha comes from having desires that are, that are impossible to fulfill. And the desires that are impossible to fulfill are desires that are based on the fact that the world is controllable and that things are permanent and, and it never works out. I, so I think they're saying the same thing. And they're saying it at the same time. So I was reading, I don't know if it was Annie Besant this morning or if it was Pablo. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I had both books on the, on the table and I was looking at both. I don't know who said this. So since she's dead and he isn't, we will give him credit. But, you know, I think it's, no, it's in the Annie Besson book I was looking at. And she says, sorry, <laughs> where, where is Pablo? Uh, sorry. Your book is brilliant, though, I have to tell you. So um, she says, you know, where, why the commonality? And then she says, oh, you know, different, she gives you different options. And she talks about maybe there were these masters who then passed it on, and Buddha was one of them, and Ecclesiastes maybe was one of them. I, I think that they're saying similar things. I think all the great mystics and sages are saying similar things because they all tap into the fourfold perennial truth of perennial wisdom. They, they all tap into the same truth. You know, the, there is no religion higher than truth. The truth that they tap into or the dharma they, tra they tap into is perennial, is this perennial wisdom. And then they, they pull out of it and then are, they pull the perennial wisdom through their culture and articulate to articulate it in a way that speaks to their time. So I don't think we have to, I, I just think they're coming from the same place, spiritually, ontologically, existentially, as, as well as chronologically. Besides Pablo, do you have any authors that you feel that are very good in the perennial wisdom area? Besides, well, I would have to say, Pablo is here. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> here. Here's who, I, who I, would, I would read if you're looking for a quick, quick bio, biography. Uh, I love Alan Watts's book, The Book, The Taboo Against Knowing Who You Are. It's his version of Vedanta. I think that Wayne Teasdale's book um, on Mystic Heart really articulates the, the perennial wisdom. Uh, Andrew Harvey has a book called The Direct Path. My book, Perennial Wisdom for the Spiritually Independent, available on the back table? I don't know, that's a question. There, there, I think there were some yesterday. I, I mean, those are the, there's a lot more you could look at, but those are some really solid, solid books on that. Um, you mentioned when you truly see someone's face, you can do them no harm. And, um, How do you, with someone who is, is causing yeah. world suffering, I think you know where, where I'm going. <laughs> How do you do that? Are, are you talking about a specific subset of people with orange hair? Or are you talking about? <laughs> Not the orangutan. Not the orangutan. So, so it's a very important question, and we are out of time. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me broaden it, you know, because it's not just uh, him, who's, it's like Voldemort, you know, he who shall not be named. Uh, how do you deal, how do you see the face of someone who's evil or, or causes such great suffering, maybe to you personally or maybe to other people? So I, I struggle with this all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm not one who says, oh, we shouldn't judge. I judge. And even if you say we shouldn't judge, that's very judgmental. <laughs> so... This is, this, is, this is how I understand it. My dad and I had, from my entire life, I'm 67, he died three years ago. For the first 50 years of my life, we had a relationship like this, right? Just not connecting at all. I was everything he didn't want in a boy. You know, no sports, no nothing, right? So we never really got along. My, my dad is from a generation where there's a couple things men have to do. They have to, earn a, they have to be the breadwinners. They also have to do all the driving, and they also have to answer all the phones. So when I would call home, because I'm a good Jewish boy, I would call home every week, and my dad would answer, and he would hear my voice, and he had 
two things to say. First, everything okay? And I would say, yeah. He goes, here's your mother. <laughs> and that was our conversation. And I didn't get along with him, and I thought he was hurtful and mean. I mean, you know, all the stuff that I normally would pay a therapist to work through, except I, I tell you instead. Um, and then my mother went deaf, and I had to talk to my dad because there was, there was no alternative. And I started working with the Buddhist practice of metta, you know, sending blessings to, to people, including people with whom you're struggling. But the way it was taught to me from my Rebbe, Zalman Shakta Shalomi, was to, and this is in my book, um, The Sacred Art of Loving Kindness, also available at the back table, or bookstores near you, or I'm talking into the camera, or, you know, Amazon. So, <laughs> and Zalman said, use this phrase. So you th I'm thinking of my dad. This is how I did it. May you be free from fear. May you be free from compulsion. May you be blessed with love. May you be blessed with peace. And as I started working with this and talking to Reb Zalman, what I realized was my dad was a frightened person. I mean, part of his generation. He grew up during the Depression. Then he was in World War II. He had this attitude toward everyone. If you weren't Jewish, you were an anti-Semite. That was his, he was so afraid of Nazis and everyone was a closet Nazi and he had all these, these fears. And he, and he feared that the, that the economy was going to collapse any minute and that there was never going to be enough to go around, you know, real um, uh, zero-sum kind of thinking. And given the jobs that I had taken on and the, the work I was doing, he was afraid I'd never have enough money to take care of my family. When I realized he was driven by fear, and then I realized that the fear was driving his behavior. His, he was com doing compulsive things that he couldn't help doing, like yelling at me and criticizing me. Oh, but I realized through the practice it was all done from love. So I don't want to minimize evil people. But I do want to at least put the idea out there that these people are trapped. These people are, are deeply broken. And if I can see that in them, then I, don't, I, can, I can have compassion for them as I lock them up, right? as, I remove them, as I remove them from society, because so many of them are evil. I mean, my dad wasn't a criminal. But I can, I can see, I can have compassion for them and not be so reactive in, in uh, response to them. And in many cases, I can work to remove them from society if they are really that that detrimental. Lock him up. Lock him. <laughs> yeah. There's a Francis Bacon quote that just popped into my head near the end of your, 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 your speaking. And uh, I just, I'm really curious to know what kind of uh, uh, reaction you have to it. You've probably heard it before. Is where he says, if someone tells you, or if you ask someone or, that they are wise or not, he says, you probably don't want to trust their answer. But if the question is, are, is someone happy? He says, you can pretty much always trust their answer. Really? That's Francis Bacon. Well, look, as a Jew, Bacon never comes up. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a new. <laughs> 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 I did. I had to go there. I had to go there. But I, di I disagree with the, with the quote. Uh, I, I don't think you can trust people if, when you ask them if they're happy, either. I mean, especially today, everyone's happy on Facebook. You know, like everyone's taking Instagram pictures of the food that they're eating, you know, and oh, look at me, I'm having whatever it is, you know, tuna fish or something. And it's usually not that, but you know, it's some exotic thing. <laughs> So I don't think, I think people are desperate to be happy, but they're never really happy. And I think that, I, I wish we were desperate to be wise, but we're not really wise. But I think, I think people lie. <laughs> I think they lie all the time, mostly to themselves. But if you ask me if I'm happy, it, it'll depend. I, I would try to figure out what are you really asking me. So if you're asking me if I'm going to blow my brains out, no. But if you're asking me if I'm happy, no, I'm happy now and then two seconds later, no, I'm not happy. I'm just in flux. Nothing is permanent. So I think, I, personally, I think it's a dumb question. But then I've never had bacon, so I, I could be really, <laughs> I could be really wrong. Remember Phil Donahue used to do that? He would run around with the mic. 
So therefore, there is no such thing as happy, then there's no such thing as sad. Oh, I didn't say there's no such thing as happy. I just said you're not. <laughs> but, well, there's a kind of a mixture there. Yeah, it's a mixture. It's a mixture. There's this wonderful, I don't know if, if I can remember it. There, there's, my, my next book is called, I don't know what it's called, Am Amazon determines the titles, but the, the working title for me is Living the Surrendered Life. And I'm working a lot with this Japanese philosophy called uh, Tariki, Other Power, where you realize you have no control. How do you live without control? That's what the book is about. And, and, I, and I apologize to the author because I can't remember his name. The book is just called Tariki. And he, he has this, he coins this phrase, sublime melancholy. It's sublime melancholy. You see the brokenness, and yet there's a, 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 sub, a, a sublime nature to it. I, I read that sort of, there's a joy to even the unhappiness or something. You, get, you know that Japanese, I don't know what it's called, the Japanese art form where you take a cracked cup and you fill it with gold and suddenly it's this beautiful, you know, the cracks become beautiful. That's, that's, what it's, that's, that's what I think life is, could be life, could be like. And so I don't know if that's happy or sad. I think those are just fleeting states. I want to be in a state of what this guy calls sublime melancholy or whatever that art form is where I can fill the cracks of my life with, with gold. It's called wabi-sabi. Yeah, wabi no, wabi-sabi is another great term. Wabi-sabi, wabi means impermanent, sabi means imperfect or it's the other way around. But it's, it's impermanent and, and imperfect. Yeah, so that is what, how, that's my fundamental philosophy of life. I think it fits well with Ecclesiastes. But this art form is called something else. Anybody know? It's with an I, I think, but I don't remember. But it's, it's based on the wabi-sabi, yeah. What's it called? Spell it? K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I? G-I, Kintsugi. So that's the filling in the cracks. Did you know that, or you just looked that up? You looked it up. <laughs> For a second. Yes, no, I think that's... Thank, th we we want to give thanks to Lord Google, and, uh, and thanks to Christopher for looking it up. From uh, that French philosopher, as you would say in French, uh, Voltaire, actually he was more of a literary guy, but anyway, he said, God is a comedian playing to an audience afraid to laugh. Whoa, did he say that? That is great. Do you all hear that? God is, this is Voltaire. God is a comedian playing to an audience afraid to laugh. Whoa, I love that. I think that we're all afraid, to one extent or another, we're all afraid to laugh. We take this way too seriously. And because we're afraid to laugh, we are so easily manipulated. So I don't know if you've, any of you have read Holy Rascals. This is just an infomercial. My whole thing <laughs> available at the book table, right? But the Holy Rascals book, one of the parts of it says the thing that religion, what I call big religion, you know, the religion that sides with big brother and creates the fascistic world that we're entering, that big religion is afraid of two things fundamentally. One is love, because the first thing religion does is tell you who you can't love, right? So they always want to control who you can marry. The second thing is they're afraid of laughter. Because if you laugh, you're free. And so the religion doesn't, any religion, doesn't want you to go in, in and laugh. I mean, I could go on about it, but there's a wonderful movie and a book. Umberto echoes the name of the rose. Read the book and or watch the movie. It's a Sean Connery movie. I love Sean Connery. And it's all about monks being murdered in this monastery over the question of laughter. And it's really, really powerful. Well, it's a comment. We're on the same page. My first book was called Offbeat Prayers for the Modern Mystic, and I have a long thing where I wrote about what is called the valves of seriousness that our culture takes collectively, and yeah. it, it holds this somberness into place. And then I have songs for enlightenment that go like joy to the world. We've been too serious. Yeah. We've been too serious. And that book <laughs> can be purchased. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I agree. I agree. The real revolution is, is going to be through laughter. And if we, if we don't create, you know, if, if you can't come together to do deep spiritual work and laugh, then I think we're, we're doomed. So, so laugh. <laughs> I demand it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.